Hey, I'm Robert Wolanski, the Director of Communications at Heritage Auctions. Sorry we're a couple minutes late, but if you uh, have been joining us for these virtual previews over the last year, you probably noticed that we have switched formats. We've gone to uh, YouTube and Facebook only, which means uh, everything looks a lot clearer, and uh, I get to be in the same room with these folks for a change, which is awfully nice. I assume you've had your shots. Yes. Oh, thank God. Uh, anyway, I'm joined here by Dustin Johnson, who's uh, in our uh, vice president of our currency department. And I'm joined by Raiden Honecker, who's the consignment director in the currency category. So it's nice to see everybody here. It's nice to see you fellas in person for a change. It's yeah. Nice to, it's nice to nice touch to you. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you again. It's been months. <laughs> it has been. I feel like it's been way, way too long. But obviously, yeah. we're here to discuss the uh, state of the market when it comes to currency, uh, U.S. currency. And we're also going to look back uh, at some highlights from uh, the last year or so. And we're going to look ahead to the uh, the year that is, specifically the Mike Coltrane Collection, Part 2, uh, Signature Auction, which is upcoming on June 24th at 4.50 p.m. Central Time. Is that correct? That's, That's when when we'll, you'll be lined to get be live to get online. Uh, and it will commence right at 5 with bidding. Excellent. Uh, but obviously, you can bid now. That's when the actual auction takes place. So, gentlemen, uh, and, and hopefully Bruce Hagen will join us here shortly. He's our uh, our currency expert in New York. Uh, we've had a bit of a connection issue with him. Uh, but here in Dallas, everything is A-OK. -okay. So, look, we'll, we'll take your questions uh, at TommyH at uh, HA.com. Is, uh, Tommy N, I'm sorry. Tommy N at HA.com. Tommy Noel's on the other side of this producing this um, particular uh, experience today. Happy birthday, Tommy. Um, Happy birthday. Thanks for spending your birthday running this particular production. So Tommy N at HA.com. If you have a question you'd like to send anonymously, uh, if you have a question you want to just ask, go ahead and type it in and uh, we'll get to that as well. So feel free to ask anything you would like to ask uh, about U.S. currency and these gentlemen will get to it. Some folks have submitted questions in advance, so uh, we'll get to those as well. But look, I want to ask you guys right up front what this last year has been like. Certainly, every category across the board here at Heritage has seen significant upticks, and everybody has their own reasons why. So what has it been like for you, and, and can you explain sort of what has been the reason for uh, the success in currency in the last year? It's been a very interesting year uh, across the board. What's interesting is that uh, when, when the COVID restrictions and quarantine started, we didn't know what was going to be happening. So we didn't know how we would source material. We didn't know how the auctions would play out. Um, what was nice is that Heritage was uniquely uh, positioned to fare through quarantine because our website was so strong, because our bidding platform was already built out and the best in the industry. Um, once we were able to continue sourcing material and getting things in, uh, what we saw is that everybody who couldn't spend money on traveling and going out and things like that, um, and then had excess amounts of time to sit down and do the things at home, like crack open the Red Book again or crack open their Friedberg book, they started focusing on their hobbies again. Right. Uh, one nice thing about uh, numismatics is that it's an indoor activity and doesn't, <laughs> uh, like some of our teenage years, didn't require a lot of uh, socialization. So sure. um, that's how you create a numismatist, by the way. Yeah. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, a little bit of no video games and no socialization and uh, Friedberg book, and you get a numismatist. So. It's amazing um, I did become a professional Dungeons and Dragons uh, player. Yeah, but I'm sure you're pretty good, right? Not anymore. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> as far as you know. <laughs> so you have people uh, cracking open their books, pulling their collections out, seeing kind of where they left off. Maybe they got busy with life. Well, life kind of came to a screeching halt. We all had more time than we knew what to do with. We painted our house, and I cleaned out the safe too. Um, and I figured out, you know, refocused my collection a bit and decided what I wanted to buy and then also put some things into to auction to, to take advantage of the strong market prices. So you have all these people trapped at home. You have, uh, for those that were fortunate enough to, to continue to have jobs and well-paying jobs, you had income coming in with very little going out right. for discretionary income. And one of the things that you could do is uh, scratch that itch for collecting by going online and looking at what's out there to buy, to add to your collection. Um, some people just spent months uh, going through our listings and trying to find out what that they wanted, wanted, wanted to buy. And then right. once they were ready, they had 
savings there that they could put into the hobby again. Uh, so it's been a very, very interesting year. All that demand, all the increase in bidders, the increase in uh, discretionary income ended up pushing prices up across the board in our company and currency as well. So we see a double digit increase in the number of bidders and in a lot of places, double digits uh, increases in prices, sometimes uh, multiples of prices that we saw a year or two ago. We'll get to some highlights in a little bit from uh, from past sales and talk mm -hmm. about uh, how prices have been impacted by the very things you're talking about. By the way, that's a nice humble brag. Uh, I was cleaning out the safe. I, I, I don't know what that's like. So yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. that's great. Um, so Raiden, I'm going to ask you this question because uh, as one of the younger people at the table, uh, that's clear from just looking at you. Um, has the makeup of the currency collector changed? Are, as somebody asked us in the questions before we began, are younger people entering the hobby? And if so, why? Absolutely. Just like Dustin stated, you couldn't go out and do outdoor activities. Just nothing was open. So the, the younger community um, to take note of this, and they started exploring new types of hobbies and paper currency collecting was, was one of them. Uh, personally, you know, uh, prior to my time at Heritage, I was a part-time dealer, uh, strictly in the online presence. And just during that that time period of, you know, early last year, um, you know, to now, it's insane. The, the amount of new collectors that have entered the hobby that are on my age. Um, Which is how old, by the way? 23. Good 23 Lord. years old. So it, it's great. I love to see it because when I first started collecting, I, I was worried. I, I was worried um, about the up and coming new collectors, um, you know, that that are in this age group. But af after seeing how many new collectors have got involved in, in collecting, that, that worry is no longer. So I, I want to back up a sec because I think this is a fascinating discussion if i may derail us for just a moment you're 23 how old were you when you got into it uh, i started collecting when i was 12. so uh 11 long years ago <laughs> um what got you into it and and what is bringing younger people in their 20s to it because i have to say this is the age of the nft this is the age of the sports card or the comic book or this is the age of things that are more pop culture focused for younger audiences so what is it that draws you know, somebody who's 23 to a bill from the night from 1928 or from 1880. Gotcha. Well, you know, I, I, I absolutely love paper currency and I have to admit, I got started with coins, you know, that's um, okay. You're all right. You're amongst <laughs> friends. Here. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to the <laughs> currency collecting community, but uh, no, I got my, my first you wise with coins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, it all started with wheat cents as most cases sure. are with, uh, um, Coin collecting, um, and and that soon turned into paper currency collecting. Probably when I was about sixteen, I started learning about uh, national bank notes. Um, and I'm from Georgia. Um, I never so would have guessed. Oh, really? <laughs> I get that all the time. Um, but it, it was neat seeing some some of the the local towns and cities on, on paper currency, and I was just you know amazed by it right so so that that's where my interest started um and, you know that, that at that time i started acquiring some some nicer notes and, and in time it, it occurred to me how good of an investment that this this was um you know paper currency uh, since i started collecting has, has appreciated um you know within the last decade i've been able to to, to note that um so so it's a, it's a great um hobby to get involved in um it's you know like i said the investments here um are, are superb in, in most cases you're not going to lose any money if you're if you're smart and you're knowledgeable and you know what you're buying at the right prices um it, it's a fantastic hobby um um, you know, to, to get into. And, and there are gobs of collectors in this age range. And traditionally, we would know who was collecting in the age range based on the attendance at, at coin and currency shows, right. which is now skewing much older. What we don't see is these young collectors at shows, but they're there. They're buying in a completely different way. Remember, this is a generation that is buying their clothes online. 
they're buying cars online, they're buying their groceries online. Everything's coming on. Right. They're, they're consuming everything online. You just don't see them as a tangible head at in the head count at a coin show anymore. Absolutely. They're there. If you scour the book, uh, scour Facebook for these different collecting communities, they're there. Um, these young dealers are buying and selling on Facebook. They're buying and selling on Instagram, eBay. There are a lot of different places. And they're coming to our website because we've got uh, our archives are a wealth of information. So they're coming here as an aggregate of, in, uh, of a wealth of information to help them in their collecting journey. Um, and I encourage everybody here, if you haven't explored our archives, do it. It's a free resource. There's so much information out there. I mean, you could fill volumes with the uh, things that we put into these descriptions right. and aggregate in every auction. So I, I do wanna ask, I'm fascinated by this because to me, and we talked about this last time we did one of these, I, I have fallen in love with currency in my year here in as much mm -hmm. as that I love the story that it tells. There, it's, it's artwork from one perspective, it's the history of this country from another perspective. It's also an investment. Mm -hmm. So do you find that folks are coming to it for any one specific reason or is it an amalgamation of, of all of them? And in as much as that, you know, I think somebody asked us a question pre this discussion beginning, which is uh, currency prices have not kept up with most other investments and maybe not even with inflation. Has recent news about rising inflation gotten collectors more interested in adding notes? Uh, is there a belief that currency prices will indeed catch up to other assets? That's an interesting question. We're seeing a lot of money uh, from very astute investors coming into the market in all the different categories that we handle. Um, is inflation coming? My personal opinion is yes. I mean, there's just so much money coming in from central banks into the economies that you can't walk away from this without some price increases. Right. Now we see it uh, on a microeconomic level with the price of air conditioning units or garage doors or, or lumber. lumber. Yeah, I mean, there's just no end to the microeconomic cases here. But in, in the larger aspect of, of what's going on, I think people are looking at it and going, you know what, I don't want the cash sitting in my bank account. I'm going to put it into something tangible right. that might, when every, when all the dust settles, is going to be worth more than the cash was sitting in, in the bank. Um, so we do see some of that. Um, I've personally uh, put more money into collectibles because I'd rather have it in something that I think will fare better right. with inflation than having it in the bank account. Um, but again, that's uh, that's a personal situation, whether or not you have the resources to do that one, and then where you think the economy is going. And we don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know how prices will fare in the end. Um, collectors, as we see them, 90% of them love the history, the aesthetics, the stories behind it. I mean, we're in it for the passion of it. One of the great things about that passion is that it's a store of value. Right. Um, and a, some some collector collectibles don't keep up with the market or, uh, you know, the, the eighth wonder of the world, which is compound interest. But you still have a store of value that you're not, uh, you know, that isn't deteriorating right. in some way or is a, a one off experience that while you have the memories, um, you don't have that money anymore. So um, there's a lot of different ways. And it, it's a very personal uh, situation as far as how you collect and why. So well, it's it's what we tell people all the time: don't buy just to invest. Buy what you love. Exactly. That's the most important and, thing of all. This. Yes. So the two key things uh, when it comes to collecting: buy what interests you. If it interests you, it's probably going to interest somebody else. And buy the best you can afford. So if you are looking for something that you really want, a particular type note, a, a particular national bank note, buy the best one you can find, um, and that we've seen time and time again with the best collections, those two pieces of information have served uh, the collectors that have done the best over time right. uh, investment wise, the best. And, and I can tell you the people that make money in this hobby are the collectors who do a lot of research and wait patiently and focus on the best. Right. Um, so, and it, it, again, time and time again, and the Coltrane auction, which we'll, we'll get to a little bit later is one of those, multi-decade decade long uh, pursuits by a collector who loved history right. and sought out some of the best pieces that you can find, um, even within the grade ranges um, or across the board. It's, it's, it's incredible. So this is a great uh, offering to illustrate 
what patients can do in this hobby. Well, it's interesting because <clears throat> it's something similar to Bob Simpson in U.S. Coins. He was very, he was very much the same way. He wanted the best looking and the best version of each thing he could get his hands on. He did, and when it comes to market, it is, it's an event. Right, yeah. it's a huge event. Yeah. Coltrane's the same way in that regards as yeah. well. Uh, but I do want to, I want to back up a little bit, go to the fun signature auction, and talk about how well that did. Uh, the number of bidders and some of the highlights from that, because we do want to look backward and give you some sense of you know what what's what's done well, and obviously uh, there was a certain note in this particular auction that got a lot of publicity as well, <laughs> but but it did what eight million is that right? Uh, yeah, we were we were right around eight million dollars. Um, uh, traditionally, it would have been a ten or eleven million dollar auction. Um, we took out some very cool uh, collections that were very. Um, very well curated and we actually had those in our monthly auctions uh, throughout January and February. So we offered a ton of value over $10 million worth of great currency in January and February, uh, you know, marked with the $8 million for the fund signature that we had uh, close to 2000 bidders place bids um, on just under 2000 lots. So think about how many bidders there are out there now for the amount of currency that we've presented. Right. Um, it's, it's been very, very strong. What prior in the last couple of years, what would have been a, a, an average number of bidders for a, an auction, like a signature auction? Yeah. Um, a signature auction, we've been averaging about 2000, yeah. but we've, as we've been curating the number of lots down from seven or 8,000, right. we're down now to maybe 2000 of those lots. And the number of bidders has not decreased. So we've spread out that selection a little right. bit um, and lot for lot. So, so what we did is we did a comparison, not necessarily on the number of uh, bidders, because we didn't have the exact same data to, to work with. Right. What we did do is look at it on a lot by lot basis. And you're looking at a 20 to 30 percent increase in the number of bids placed on every single lot. So, and then in the, our weekly auctions, you see that same uptick. You mean showcase auctions? Showcase auctions. And we'll, we'll discuss that, <laughs> that term, terminology uh, change here a, a little bit later. Um, we've seen just an increased number of participants across right. the board. <clears throat> so, obviously, the 1996 $20, the, the, the Del Monte note, that yeah. got me a, a significant amount. I know people probably want to see some pictures and not just us for a little while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Talk to me about why this did as extraordinarily well as it did, because it was fascinating. This, we talk about pop culture. This became sort of a pop culture phenomenon during the, the period leading up to fun signature. It did. So when this first came to market, uh, we're talking almost 15 years ago now. Um, we went out, we picked it up. It hit news everywhere. Um, and this is uh, before things went viral. I mean, I, I don't know when the term viral came into our lexicon, um, but I had a friend who was in Europe at the time traveling and said, hey, I, I saw your name in the paper <laughs> and it had this note. Um, so even then it captured uh, everybody's uh, uh, imagination because it's so cool and so, uh, uh, so obvious uh, type of an error um, that now that we have so many other different ways for people to spread news electronically. Right. It went even further this time. So we're talking about 30,000 page views on our on our website. And then I don't know how many media outlets we hit. Um, a lot. Yeah. I, it, it was incredible. It was like Superman. It was like action number one or Detective 27 or a, uh, you know, it was big. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was big. And uh, it's a great thing for the hobby in my opinion. What's great about this this particular error, it's an error that we see uh, occur occasionally with other debris that comes into the printing floor that obstructs part of the printing. Uh, oftentimes that debris falls off, so you just have a blank spot. Right. In this case, it's a sticker, it sticks to the, to the item. <laughs> it's uh, a piece of, usually the debris that we see is debris that comes from the machines, from uh, the scrap of the printing process. In this case, there's very little way, very few ways that a banana sticker is going to make it onto the printing floor. And this had to make it onto the printing floor. You're talking about it being affixed between the second and third printing phases. Right. Um, where it is, if it was off just a little bit, even if it happened on the, the, the other, uh, uh, after the second printing and wasn't in a place where a third printing would come down, we wouldn't know that it was an error. 
because we wouldn't have known that there was ink on top of it or that there was a there, <laughs> right. there was an impression on top of it. I mean, the, everything about it is so perfect. It's so colorful. Um, it's just it's an in your face error and errors. The value of errors is always dependent on the eye appeal. This one just sticks out. Um, every it, it's got a great name. We call it the Del Monte note. So it's in our lexicon of greatest all time errors. And now in this particular instance, it's one of those things that has become a cultural icon within currency. And that's why it, it, it went from, we, we saw a realization 15 years ago of about 25,000 to now 396,000. How stunned were you when that <clears throat> hits that number? We were amazed. Um, and, but I wasn't surprised after you look at who the players are. The players are uh, some of the biggest names in coin errors uh, and some of the biggest names in numismatics together. So it captured their intrigue and passion too. Um, and you combine that with, uh, you know, the, the, the quality and levels of their collections. I mean, they just had to have it. Um, and in fact, I was on the phone with the underbidder and he said, <laughs> say keep going but he said if that guy doesn't pay you'd call me tomorrow i'll buy it <laughs> i mean look I'm, I'm fascinated by just how well it did and, and you talk about the people who were in play for this particular yeah uh bill you know and i want to go back to something that you were saying earlier about younger people coming in this is, seems to be kind of one of those ideal it's a it's a modern bill it's from 1996 yeah. Yeah. uh it does have that it has the the nomenclature that the del monte it, it has sort of that pop culture appeal that may be something from the 1800s might not. Yeah. Right. You know, if you look at some of the other obstruction errors, a piece of paper affixed to a, to a note, right. um, that's not going to intrigue somebody who's not a collector. I mean, this this intrigues everybody. You right. immediately go, wow, maybe our government isn't infallible like we think. So uh. I, I think it I, I think it takes far less than that to uh that's to true, just... yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's uh let's let's back up uh, about 60 years from that. There was also a I believe a, a, a Federal Reserve note that also did remarkably well, yes. Yeah, so uh, we we picked out a, a couple of other highlights yeah. um, from this uh, uh, from this auction and how they did. Um, did you want to cover this particular yes, absolutely. piece? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a big fan of these small size rarities, and this is. You fascinate so me, right? I'm not going to lie. You fascinate <laughs> me. <laughs> His passion is in, in, infectious. So. I have to say, if it just, I, I've never imagined I would be talking to a 23 year old about a hundred year old bill that, or a 90 year old bill that you. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Here we are. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> but uh, this is. Kind of like the, the king of, of, of small size rarities. Uh, when, when you look at this note, it, it, it's one might not um, expect it to be as rare as it is. However, there's only a total of three of these light green seal Federal Reserve no stars in all districts combined in PMG's population report. It's just simply rare. Um, and we've only sold just a few of these examples in the last 20 years. Um, and this one did remarkably well. I know we'll talk about small size or you know, the small size market in a little bit. We had a question uh, come in about that. Yeah. But this sold for six times um, more than, than the estimate um, that we placed on it. We put a three thousand dollar estimate and brought in a total of eighteen thousand. Well, we like to say estimates are just the beginning of the conversation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Um, and to, to go further with this note, this is the only light green seal or dark green seal star note from the Richmond district. Um, so it, it's completely uh, fascinating on so many levels. Um, and, you know, it, it entertained just robust uh, bidding. Um, and a lot of eyes were on this note. And it surprised you as well? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we were pretty surprised by that. And one of the other questions that we got uh, before we started today was, um, you know, we see stamp shows decreasing in uh, attendance and, and some even numismatic shows decreasing in, in attendance. There's a worry that uh, the collectors are disappearing. They're just buying in different ways. Um, and this is one of them. Um, but when it comes to uh, in that question in particular was they felt like the small size, the market for small size type notes was was decreasing. And this is just one of many examples. I mean, we could spend all day here and bore you to death and, and lullaby you to, to sleep tonight <laughs> with uh, all the different great small size notes that we've sold uh, this year um, like this that are just exceeding uh, all of our expectations. They're incredibly rare. 
uh, those sets are easy to put together. They're kind of like penny boards. Right. So you've got, instead of just four major types with signature combinations, you've got uh, 12 diff districts, and then you've got the star notes, which are the replacements for the errors that they made in the printing process. So for each given, like let's say the 1928B here, you've got 24 between the regular issues and uh, the star notes. And then you've also got the light and green, dark green seals. So you could make this into a 36 to 48 note mini set, like a penny board, and just focus on 1928Bs for the next year and have a lot of fun doing it and find out how rare these things really are. And then you expand that. You've got all the different denominations that you can do it with. So collectors like a pursuit. Right. And that pursuit is uh, very well laid out in small size because you've got the different districts and the different series and things like that. It's very, very fun and easy to get into small size. Um, and this is one of the major rarities there. Uh, you know, he was saying that it was the only known uh, Richmond star that's in the PMG pop report. And not only that, uh, most of the stars for these 1928 20s, they rarely come out. You rarely see them in uncirculated condition. Right. So, I mean, try to top this for the 1928 B20. It's, going to be real tough. So. I would never dare. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's interesting because it does bring up somebody a uh, question that Sodi had submitted. And again, if you have a question, feel free to type it in. Uh, if you want to be anonymous, Tommy N at HA.com. But where are you seeing the most new interest? Is it nationals? Is it large? Uh, is it large size type? Is it the small size of the silver certificates, the gold certificates? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah. Large size has taken off. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the major type no uh, types in coins, the Morgan dollar, the walking Liberty half right. dollar. Um, it, it represents the biggest, prettiest phases of our currency printing, uh, often with a, a lot of the most historic vignettes on them, right. individuals, things like that. Um, so we saw exponential growth in that area. We've seen it in small size as well, where people are, when they sit down and they take just a little bit of time to find out and look at the population reports and see what's come up, finding out exactly how rare these things are and delving a little bit deeper into our descriptions and looking at the pop report data that we compile on the website. They're seeing the rarity and now those prices are catching up to that rarity. Yeah. And they're still in currency. The stats that you get for the money blows away coins. And we'll discuss a little bit of that more later. Um, so large and small have been great. Nationals have been great. You know, people uh, Raiden, got into nationals. He talked about uh, banknotes that are uh, were issued uh, kind of near your hometown, in your hometown. Right. I've done it too. I collected Arizona nationals. It's a lot of fun to collect something that that you have a personal connection to. Sure. I, so, love, I love seeing a bill that says Dallas, yeah. Texas on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Are we seeing, and I, this is a question just that I have, are we seeing cross- um, pollination, I guess, between categories. Are we seeing coin collectors buy a lot of currency these days? Are we seeing comics collectors buying currency, currency buying comics, buying sports cards? Are we seeing a lot of that? Because you see some of that yes. within comic books yeah. uh, and pop culture memorabilia. But are you seeing that here? Uh, yes. So there's very few collectors that collect one thing. Uh, my wife would argue that I'm not a collector, that I'm a hoarder, <laughs> um, because I don't just stop at coins and currency. I've got real photo postcards and um, some pottery from Minnesota and, you know, <laughs> artwork and movie posters. I mean, so coming to our website, it's like being in a, in, in a kid's store built for adults sure. uh, who have collecting issues. Um, <laughs> well, so, it's, it's, there is a gene <laughs> that we all discuss. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's really easy to get lost on our website and get lost in a new arena of collecting. We, we had a guy uh, come in and say, well, I want to buy some currency. I just cashed out of comics. I've got so much money that I've, cashed out of the comics, I want to buy something that interests me here. Um, collectors have a penchant for artwork, for history, for rarity. Um, we like to chase these things. And HA.com is a never-ending chase right. of incredibly cool things. So, I mean, I've bought, I think, out of 15 or 16 different categories, everything from wine to signed jerseys from my favorite sports teams to uh, we've got Western movie posters hanging in our uh, in our living safe. room around around the TV. So uh, again, no end to it. So I want to I want to hit one thing from fun before we get to Central States because I do want to get to Coltrane because there's a lot to talk about there and bidding is already pretty rampant to yeah. 
for a, for an auction that happens uh, in a couple of days. So let's talk about the. Uh, I'm fascinated by the five dollars uh, 1863 legal tender that obviously did very well as well. Yeah, and this is a great uh, illustration of the movement in large size. So you've got something that's not. Uh, hey, there's Bruce. Bruce, can you hear us? No. Okay. We can't hear Bruce. Bruce was a, a special consultant here for the Coltrane collection, and we want to get his input on uh, a couple of uh, his favorite pieces from the auction. So he may have to sign it. However, Bruce, yeah. can you hear us? <laughs> he can hear us, but we can't hear him. So we'll figure that out in just a moment. But let's get yeah. back to 1863. We're working. I'll bore you while we work on those <laughs> issues. So the Freeburg 63, you're talking about uh, the 1862 and 1863 $5 were the first kind of circulating legal tender notes during the Civil War to help finance uh, the fight against the Confederacy. So they're very, very popular. Uh, at the left-hand side, you've got uh, a vignette uh, of the statue that's on, on the top of the dome of the Capitol. Um, See, I love these because they are beautiful, because of the story they tell. This, to me, appeals in so many ways as someone who knows absolutely nothing about currency other than what you what I learned from you guys. Completely fascinating. You know, and, the, and this is the first, uh, we, we have the War of 1812 notes that this collection is very heavy in, um, but federal currency reemerged in the 1860s because we had to find money to support the war. Right. Um, now these $5, they you can get them in pretty nice grade. This is very near the top. So you're looking at uh, one of the few 66s that's been sold. While there's seven of them and there's 18 known in 65 EPQ, in currency, we kind of say that's common. If you compare it to coins, it, it should be you know, a $50,000, $60,000 item. The previous record for this particular item in 66 EPQ was $7,800 until our January auction where it sold for $13,200. This is one... Uh, this is a note that if you're patient enough, you could buy it in the same grade in the next two to three years if you were patient enough. Right. So it's not like you're looking at an influx of all this money and the ultimate in rarity. It's something that's achievable, but the prices have just been incredible for high quality type across all categories in currency. And not just type, colonials in high grade, small size and high grade, nationals and high grade, people are focusing on quality because now when they're sitting down at home and they've got some time to do some research, they look at the pop reports, they take a little bit of extra time to go through the, the archives and go, wow, this thing is really special. I know that I've got to have this as kind of an echelon of, of US paper survivors. Before we look ahead to Coltrane, which we'll get mm -hmm. to in just a second, there was one auction to also look back at, which is Central States. Uh, that did 5.6 with about 1,200 bidders, mm -hmm. uh, only 1,100 lots. Yeah. I mean, that's yep. kind of extraordinary. I assume you were surprised by how well it did, given how few lots there were. A absolutely. And again, the number of bids on every single lot was just tremendous. Did you find um, that, you know, World of Nation coins during the Paramount auction, their lots took a long time because there were a lot of bidders. Are you guys seeing that as well? They did. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we've pared down our signature auctions. Um, you know, it used to be that 20 years ago, it was okay to run until three, four, five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we, we, here at Heritage, we value your time and we want to make sure that you're not having to, to stay up all night and then try to go to work the next morning. Um, so we've, we've spread out our selections, both with uh, those, standalone collections that we offer from time to time every right. month uh, and also our, our select auctions, which are weekly and then as well as the signature. Um, so it was a tremendous amount of, of outpour in uh, not just the number of bidders, but the, the types of bidders and how aggressive they were. So, and that was uh, very evident from the 1928, 10,000 that we saw um, right now. There's that people are, are searching for trophy notes. $5,000 and $10,000 Federal Reserves, Federal Reserve notes were the two biggest circulating denominations right. in our economy. They were printed from the 1920s into the 1940s. We're talking about the small size now. Right. They, they were available before that, but none are known. Um, and people are, are looking at, uh, I want to buy the trophy from each one of these different categories. Collectors don't stop at one, just one thing. Um, so we have somebody who comes in and uh, 
uh, actually, I can't tell you how many people want fives and ten thousands now. The ten thousand, <laughs> the ten thousand. I'd like to. I, I do. Yeah. I, I want us to look at the ten thousand and talk about how well it did because I am staggered by how well it, it is, did. and it, it actually set a new record, a, right. a price record for any small size notes out there. Um, so there it is, right there. Yeah, um, incredible rarity. You know, you're looking at a, a very fine thirty, which is kind of right in the center of where circulation would run. It's nice. It's problem free. Uh, there's only 10 1928 10,000s. Now, most of the 10,000s that you see on the market are the 1934s, of which there's about 200. So think about that rarity, okay? So if you had 10 of any major type of U.S. coins, it'd be a million-dollar-plus item, multi-million-dollar-plus item. I mean, the, the amount of rarity that you get here. Um, so not not only are there just 10 1928,000s in total, this is the only one from Kansas City came out of a Kansas City banker, banker's family who called us up and consigned it. I mean, it, and I couldn't be happier for them. They were a wonderful family to work with. Um, siblings that were all able to, you know, uh, each get a share of what their father put away for them. Right. Um, and that's a great success story in and of itself, too. Um, it, it, it's and, and when they called me and they they mentioned this, you're on the phone and you know this is the discovery of the year. This is previously unknown to our collecting community. That came out this year, and the market responded accordingly. Have you seen a lot of those, I can't believe we've never seen this in the last year? Um, yeah. Uh, within national banknotes, uh, which Rayton yeah. and I both collect, there's a lot of uh, towns where there's only one known for the bank. Um, and it's tremendously good value for the rarity that you get. I mean, think about, I, I had uh, a one known from my uh, hometown of Tucson. It was the only one known from that bank, and I owned it. I mean, how great is that? <laughs> it, it, it's so cool. And it didn't cost me anywhere near the $456,000 <laughs> that this piece. So you can buy unique notes. You can chase this rarity and make it really fun and make it your own. So. And the thing is, there's and to go up on that, there's so many uh, bank charters out there that there's, there, there's no notes reported. So there's yeah. plenty of notes to be discovered in the future, and it's exciting to think what new discovery is going to come up in the next, you know, who knows? Yeah. When you, when you, when you get the phone call and you get chills, it, it's, it, it's fun. It's like Absolutely. Christmas morning around here. <laughs> so while we've got Bruce, Bruce, can you hear us? I can hear you. We can hear you. Right. I can, I restarted my iPad. All right. Good. Well, while we've got Bruce, let's jump to the Coltrane collection. Yeah. Absolutely. Shall we? Cause that yeah. begins Thursday, June 24th at five o'clock p.m. Central. I guess you can get online at 450, but 768 total lots, correct? Pre-bidding mm -hmm. has already surpassed a million dollars. Yep. Yeah. I, I assume you are not surprised by this, uh, given how well Coltrane Collection Part 1 did. Yeah, Coltrane Part 1 was robust, yeah. <laughs> uh, very fun auction, um, and uh, dominated by true-hearted collectors. Uh, you know, when you look at the bid sheets after the auction and you go, these are these are our diehard collectors coming out of uh, out of the woodwork and and playing hard for really quality collection. Yeah. So. Bruce, if you'd like to chime in at any point while we've got you, I don't want to waste the opportunity. So, well, I think the uh, you know, I have to echo what Dustin said about the first auction. Um, there was amazing uh, collector interest in. Uh, in the bread and butter notes and um, their prices were most often well above what the current trends were at the time and really established, um, you know, new values uh, for, uh, you know, many, uh, many types of, um, you know, notes uh, such as uh, battleships and, and uh, chiefs and uh, notes. And, um, you know, all the notes found their levels because the sale, uh, was offered completely unreserved and, uh, you know, with a hundred percent sell through. And, um, I think collectors find that extremely appealing because, um, uh, they know that every bid that they're entering into, uh, you know, into the bidding uh, system, whether it's uh, uh, a pre-bidding proxy or uh, live heritage, you know, heritage live, um, they have an equal chance of success with all the other bidders. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the uh, the most active notes currently in the Coltrane Part 2, which, again, Thursday, 5 p.m. Central? 
Braden? Uh, you know, t taking a look um, uh, at some of the, the most active notes in the cell, um, obviously, you, you take a look and the educational series um, has gathered the, the most attention. And that's, you know, will all, most likely always be the case. It's just such a popular series. Uh, have, you have the amazing vignettes um, and, you know, that they, they will always bring uh, strong prices. Um, so, so, you know, we're looking forward to... Those uh, are stunning. And I, oh, absolutely. I, I love those. Yeah. You and I have talked about this before. I think that's something I'd like blown up big and hung in my house. Yeah. Like that's, that's American artwork. Mm -hmm. It is. And actually by some of the most uh, cla classically appreciated artists of the time right. came up with these designs and then were executed by the engravers at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Uh, Joseph Piordan uh, is the one that helped design uh, one of these notes. So, uh, and if you look at too, uh, when Raiden talks about uh, the large size silver certificates, if, if you look, you can actually sort the auction by most active um, for the number of bids, the number of viewers. It's really kind of fun to see what everybody else is looking at. I, so I love, I love tracking what people are tracking. I yeah. love looking at what people are bidding on. I love uh, the high, I search it by highest price, by lowest price, because I'm I'm the lowest price kind of guy. So yeah. I start. But it is. I have to say that is really kind of one of the fun things about going through all of these auctions. Yeah. So large size here has been very robust, um, as Raiden was saying. And part of that is because uh, Mike's focus was a typeset and it's incredibly robust in the number of offerings for large size. Uh, but more so than that, uh, Bruce just said that we set prices, price records in Coltrane one after the, you know, when we looked at the, the prices realized I was just in the other, in the lot viewing room talking to a lot viewer. He said, we're already at record prices and we haven't even started bidding on heritage live yet. So we've already got record prices for Coltrane 2, and I can tell you that there's still a lot of really cool things that, that you need to be targeting. It's it's a great auction. So what's at the top of the most viewed note at the moment for, mm. for Coltrane? If we're talking about all the things you can sort through, the things that might be the most coveted, I feel like there's one piece in particular that may be the highlight. Absolutely, and it may be the highlight of the entire auction. You know, that there's so many fantastic notes um, in my collection, but this one takes the cake for part two, I believe. Which and one's that? that? And that is, this the, is his favorite. Uh, I love it. Too. This is this is my, my favorite. It is the 1875 twenty dollar National Gold Bank note from Petaluma, California. Absolutely stunning, <laughs> and believed to be the finest known twenty dollar National Gold Bank note. Um, you know, and this is only one of two uh, known. Um, $20 denominations um, from this bank. Um, the, the, the amount of history behind the, this note is ab absolutely stunning. Um, and it is a... What is, well, what is some of that? I mean, I'm fascinated by it. This looks like something that, that obviously you'd... Uh, Wyatt Earp probably might have carried in his wallet. I mean, tell me about... Give me some of that that history behind it that makes it so... Uh, of which you were so enamored. Well, uh, these were based directly off of Th these were backed by yeah, gold, back yeah. which national bank notes were a fiat mm -hmm. currency. But in California, good luck circulating some bank notes amongst a, <laughs> bunch, a bunch of gold miners. It better be backed by gold. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. And it, you've talked, you and I have talked about this before. This is yeah. also one of the few pieces of paper currency that has actual coins on it. So therefore, uh -huh. it appeals to the collectors of both. Exactly. I mean, front and center, you can look there, you have the 1871 uh, double eagle. And it's just, you just have a pile of gold coins on the bag design of that note. That that's is probably my favorite bag design out of all paper currency. It's just simply stunning, um, and collectors just want an example of a National Gold Bank note. And this is you know one of, one of the f finest notes. So it's going to be really exciting to see. What, what this fantastic note uh, realizes. So you don't have to tell me where it comes from. Obviously, we keep uh, our consigner's identity secret unless they want it made public, and I'm not going to do that here. But I'm curious how this survives this long. Where does how long has this? Where has this been kept? Where has this? Yeah, well, that's really tough to say. Um, the fact that any banknote survives this yeah. long is uh, a wonder. You know, you're talking about paper currency, which uh, is horribly is not immune to moisture aging 
uh, mold. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that that paper just degrades over time, becomes brittle. You have to have really good storage circumstances, as well as the circumstances of having a $20 note not be redeemed for right. working capital. I mean, $20 then would buy you a horse and probably a dinner and uh, a night at a hotel room at the time. Um, $20 was a lot of money. It's an ounce of gold, which today is $2,000. So imagine a $2,000 bill if we're just talking about the value of gold sitting in your, in your pocket. So you're not going to let that sit around. You're not going to misplace it. Uh, if you put it in your book bag, you're going to tear up that book bag looking for it. Um, <laughs> you know, and if you dropped it somewhere, you're certainly going to take the 10 hours to go back to get it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah. um, the fact that it survived at all is, is uh, amazing. What's interesting about gold backed notes is because you could redeem them from for gold when the premiums or the scarcity of gold rose with monetary, uh, um, with fiscal policy uh, throughout that time period people would very quickly exchange their gold notes for gold coin because they felt like they wanted to have that gold. Right. Then you go into the Civil War, people want to have specie, they want to have silver and gold in, in their in their pockets and not necessarily something backed by the government, which, by the way, if the Confederacy wins tomorrow is worthless. So the gold tomorrow is not worthless. Right. So, uh, and, and then on top of that, you're so far removed uh, the National Gold Banknotes from California, you're so far removed from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C., that you couldn't resupply it when it was heavily used. So the National Gold Banknotes were very heavily used, rarely in conditions of a very, very fine. This one is just outside of the realm of expectations for a survivor. And it's beautiful. The, the, the other thing that the Bureau of Engraving and Printing did, too, is that they put it on yellow paper. It's not the white paper that you see with all the the other it national looks gold dope, notes. Man. It's everything about it is just so cool. <laughs> Bruce, I know that you have a favorite in the uh, Coltrane Part Two that you'd like to discuss. While we have you, it is all yours. Well, I think that uh, I think that Mike's uh, very specialized collection of uh, large size Federal Reserve banknotes deserves a lot of attention in this sale. Uh, he started collecting these uh, over three decades ago when they were. Extremely uh, undervalued and um, and uh, not well collected, and uh, he desired a, not only a full typeset, but uh, uh, he uh, you know wanted to achieve uh, even unusual variants and things like that that he studied in uh, on the hand sign notes, which are from uh, 1915, the uh, uh, the five dollar, ten dollar, and twenty dollar hand signs. But um, really, the kind of the king note. Is the fifty dollars St. Louis? Um, that was the only district of the twelve Federal Reserve uh, bank districts that issued it, and um, because of that, um, this has always been an expensive note. Um, it has the unusual uh, status of uh, kind of not being an open-ended item on the um, on the books. There's only fifty-seven notes outstanding. Um, of which actually 53 are recorded at the moment. Um, but they really don't trade hands often uh, because they're essential for uh, a typeset of United States um, currency. Uh, Mike actually um, waited quite a while before he um, obtained his example uh, uh, three some years ago. And um, um, it's a beautiful piece. It's a choice extremely fine. Uh, but the um, um, the back engraving um, is um, uh, based on uh, the Panama Canal uh, opening uh, just a few years before 1918, and that strident uh, America uh, is between uh, two types of ships: a warship and an ocean liner, uh, and uh, is. is um, is a really a nautical, a nautical and a commercial type of allegory uh, by uh, by Marcus Baldwin. Um, so it's a uh, you know it's so uh, it's one of those uh, United States federal type notes that um, uh, just has so much going for it as far as uh, uh, its uh, you know difficulty in obtaining and uh, its uh, design and. Uh, and um, and how it fits into um, 
you know, being a key piece in a Federal Reserve, uh, uh, you know, banknote set. Uh, uh, and even though Federal Reserve banknotes are so much scarcer than their uh, related Federal Reserve notes, um, they're quite affordable uh, compared to, uh, especially compared to uh, legal tender notes, which uh, just seem to get uh, hotter and hotter every year. Um, uh, the pre-bidding on the legal tenders in this auction are, are cut off the charts on a lot of notes. Uh, but, uh, you know, even a beautiful battleship note is still quite a, uh, a, a very reasonably priced uh, uh, American note. Uh, and the much scarcer five and ten dollar Federal Reserve Bank notes, um, they're extremely underrated and um, and interesting uh, because the 1915 notes have have hand signatures and variants. And uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting study that could be done with them. And, uh, uh, you know, Mike, uh, Mike spent decades um, really enjoying putting this portion of his cabinet together. So. You 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 raise, you just said something there at the very end that made me realize something. Now that we've gone to this new format and more people can join us on YouTube than have ever been able to join us on our little private Zoom conversations and on Facebook as well, we've never – I take it for granted who Mike Coltrane is, but people have been asking uh, over the course of this last uh, few minutes, who was Mike Coltrane and why is his collection so special? Well, I think I should answer that. You know, I'm at that. So I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah, you know, Mike. Mike's not. A, Mike's not a was. You know, Mike. Mike is an is. Right, right, right. He's I, a I, I, very active collector still. Absolutely. And as uh, you know, as Dustin pointed out, um, uh, you know, I like the parallel of like, wait a second, I just I just sold my comic books for like one point nine. <laughs> you know, you know, after they went into their CGC slabs. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to collect uh, early silver dollars or something. So Mike right. is Mike is uh, still very actively collecting, and um, and um, he's um, he's a he's a real gentleman. Um, he's uh, 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 you know Stu uh, Stu Levine, Maureen Levine, and I who you know work together uh, you know as consultants on the project. You know, alongside with Heritage, uh, you know, we visited we visited with them at their uh, uh, you know, their hometown, uh, you know, last year, uh, right before the, uh, the lockdowns. And, uh, you know, we got to spend a lot of quality time with them and, uh, uh, they're very engaging people. And, um, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, Mike really has, uh, this great love of numismatics and the hobby. And most of all, the character of, you know, all the dealers, that he obtained his notes from over the decades, his interactions with them. Um, I, I really got to know many of the notes on a personal basis that I could kind of picture Mike obtaining them because, you know, I also knew, you know, all of these people that, you know, you know, Mike bought notes from, uh, right. you know, Don Kelly and, uh, and, um, you know, Aussie and, uh, you know, all these, you know, old time dealers, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that, I think that, that, uh, you know, we, we place that within the lot descriptions, these pedigrees, because again, it, it, it gives the notes a real personality that, you know, that that's, it's not just a commodity that was, you know, bought on an exchange. It really, that there's a, you know, there's a real humanity to collecting and a great enjoyment of it. And, uh, uh, you know, the numismatic hobby and the collectibles hobby, you know, really uh, is something that uh, uh, is a great avocation and pursuit. And as, you know, Dustin pointed out way at the beginning, um, you know, it was, I think, very important for many people uh, through the difficulty of the, of the pandemic and, uh, and, and some enforced isolation to be able to uh, go through, you know, enjoy these pursuits. Well, it's interesting because collectors collect to keep collecting. So they will occasionally part with some of their prized pieces to go get more prized pieces. We certainly saw that with Bob Simpson. Uh, we've seen them with any number of collections over the last year. 
Uh, and I do like I, I do like the way you put it, Bruce, in terms of humanizing uh, this paper in a lot of ways. Because when you see somebody like Mike who loves these particular pieces, it makes you love them even more because you understand that the best collector thought this was the best thing to own. Yeah, it's it's it you know it's 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 totally the case here. I mean, this is a you know this is a very uh, living collection the, the caliber of notes here too are are such you know you you talk about that personal connection collectors are wired to remember certain things um and you know i don't remember every note that comes through our doors because we we handle you know 30 to fifty thousand lots of currency every year but there are notes that that come in in collections like this and you go i remember the last time i saw this i was at uh in lot viewing in baltimore in 2008 i mean that's the caliber of notes right. here that you remember them from a decade ago, um, like they're a long lost friend almost. Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, we, we, we we're in the middle of selling the we, the promise collection, the comics this week. Yeah. You know, a pedigree CGC collection. People were, you know, they love the story. It's the best of the best of the best that's been seen since it came off the newsstands in the 1940s. When you have a pedigree collection, whether it's the Promise Collection of Comics or the Mike Coltrane and Currency, you, that adds an extra layer, I would think. And again, I say this having been here all of 15 months, but that adds a, a degree of specialness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to own the greatest ever. It's another thing to own the greatest ever that was owned by the greatest ever. Yeah, Mike Coltrane approved. There you go. <laughs> it has the, the seal of approval. The stamp. <laughs> Uh, is there a favorite that you have in, in this uh, upcoming auction? I do. I, you know, I personally like the Friedberg 193B, the $100 compound interest. Um, I'm fascinated with uh, the correlation between uh, financing war and the need for currency um, and how it drives an economy <laughs> uh, and, and expands the money supply in a way that, it, that, that uh, fosters growth. So what's really cool about the compound interest notes is you're, you're now coming into an issue into a, a period where people are using primarily gold and silver, some bonds, um, banking is backed by bonds, but now go to these bankers and tell them, hey, you know what? We need $10 million this week. Right. And then they're like, well, you're not getting $10 million worth of our gold. So the only <laughs> way you can entice these bankers uh, to give you this this hard currency that you need to to fund your activities is to pay them interest. They want to return on that. The compound interest notes actually paid interest and uh, varying degrees of interest right. depending on when they were issued. Um, but in gold on the front, you've got this overprint that says compound interest treasury note. You know that this is going to have a little bit of added value there. Um, some of the issues had coupons that you could clip the interest uh, and get a little bit of payment along the way. What's so great about this is that the compound interest notes overall are incredibly scarce because they paid interest. This this goes back to the, the twenty dollar national gold bank right. notes. Nobody's going to let that sit around. They're going to go and cash that in and get their interest payment. So the fact that any of them survived is very very scarce. Now you then go to the fifty and hundreds, and the number of survivors dwindles down to twelve for the hundreds. So there's three different signature, signature combinations or varieties for the $100 compound interest. There's 12 known among the three varieties. Um, and very rarely are they seen in any grade that approaches uncirculated. Right. So you're looking at one of the prime examples of Civil War dated currency right here. And it's tremendous rarity uh, for what you're getting in the price. Uh, imagine... Uh, you know, if five dollar Liberty coins uh, were only uh, printed for ten years or minted for ten years, and there were only twelve of them known for the entire design, <laughs> I mean, that's just it's unfathomable for coin collectors. But think you've only got there's only twelve of this design and denomination in total, right? So tremendous rarity. So I'll say this: we've done this for an hour, and I have to say it's been a thorough delight. Uh, but there's uh, many folks submitted some questions before we began. Uh, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to not get to their questions. And I also, uh, while we have Bruce here to, uh, to talk about the Coltrane collection, I make sure, like to make sure we do that as well. Um, so Bruce, let me start with you. Were most of Mike's notes raw or recently graded or, and are there, po are there population reports from the grading companies representative of what's available? Are there many high grade raw notes out there? Well, uh, most of Mike's notes were, uh 
were uncertified uh, mm -hmm. and um, generally purchased uh, 20 years or more ago. Uh, so uh, there are many, many, many first time certifications in this sale. Um, uh, you know, not necessarily that, uh, you know, many of them returned as top population notes, but that they certified as, you know, choice and very collector uh, uh, attractive notes. And, um, and these notes are really, um, you know, really very active uh, in the sale, as I said. Um, you know, Mike did have certified notes that he purchased. He, uh, uh, he has some very, uh, you know, high grade type notes. He has a, you know, beautiful $5 silver, uh, you know, 1886 silver dollar back. Uh, that's a 67 PPQ uh, PCGS note. And, um, um, he has a Halifax, uh, Pennsylvania uh, national uh, value back. That's a 67 PPQ note. Love that's that note. Love it. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and uh, the pre bidding on that is like, you know, uh, I guess that goes to the statement. Well, these are high prices already, you know, you know, without Heritage Live, um, you know, starting at five o'clock on Thursday. Um, so, um, uh, you know, it was, um, you know, the key with Mike's collection is that, you know, he bought notes for so long. And uh, and then he also collected in, uh, you know, he collected his War of 1812 notes and achieved, you know, the finest cabinet of those ever by, uh, you know, buying the notes at, um, you know, different um, archives of War of 1812 notes came out in the previous 25 years. And, you know, he bought some of the best notes that came from the Blanchard collection and the Boyd collection and, uh, you know, out of Ford sales and things like that. And, um, um, you know, proofs, uh, the proofs that were sold in the year 2000 by uh, Smythe and Company. And, uh, uh, you know, that uh, second portion of the collection uh, coming up is uh, is actually you know what it's it's the last train you know you know for many of these types and uh, uh, you know these notes are really you know essential they're at the front of the Friedberg book and um, you know they're you know essential to uh, you know United States type collections. Yeah, I think for a long time because they were not front and center in the Friedberg book, they didn't get the attention that they deserved. I mean, they're they are a very critical part of the discussion of the financial foundings of this country. They're, they're, and this collection is, again, without equal. It, it's the best one that's ever been formed. And this is the last part of it. Let me ask you guys real quick. Uh, somebody asks, do we see more size collections like this, the very specific uh, put together by somebody like a Mike Coltrane who knows what he's doing? Mm -hmm. or, or do you see more collections like that on the horizon? Are there more of these out there? There's a number of these out there, um, you know, collectors, because what we do is is a lifelong pursuit. Um, you know, we'll handle a half dozen collections that are uh, maybe of this caliber, caliber uh, in a given year or two. Um, now, remember that Mike spent three plus decades and not just he spent longer than that, but three very, very dedicated and very active decades putting this collection together. Right. So when you see a collection like this, this is not a happenstance. We built this in the last couple of years because we had so much money to throw at right. it. It's a, a lifetime of passion that's culminated into one offering um, that, that really speaks to not just what Mike did, but to how special these notes really right. are. Um, you know, when we were talking about uh, the, the grading issue, um, you you might look at the collection and go okay well a lot of his type notes are circulated find me a better looking xf40 epq than the piece that's in this auction or find me a better circulated bison than the one that's in this auction or a more colorful technicolor and very fine 20. i mean for the for the grades that he collected he picked one of the top one or two percent for color for eye appeal for paper quality i mean and that when you look at a collection like this you turn the page back over and over and over again, and you see this trend of curation that Mike did or, or whoever the collector may be that, you know, this is special, right? This is not just your regular auction. This is a lifelong pursuit. And it shows every page just tells that story of a focus on quality. 
Well, look, we've we've been here about an hour, uh, and I can't thank everybody enough for joining us. If there are further questions, and we didn't get to every question that had been submitted, uh, so gentlemen, give your email addresses if folks have questions that you will be personally delighted to answer for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, my, my email address is dustin at ha.com. Um, some of you have already submitted questions. I've answered some of those questions. We've hit a, a little bit of that. Um, but if there's any questions that you presented in the email that we did not get to hear today, um, you'll have an answer here shortly. So, Ray, what's yeah. your email address? Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions as well. My email is jhoniker, H-O-N-A-K-E-R, at ha.com. Send those questions on over. Bruce, would you like to give yours? Or is I that a... I can always be reached through Dustin or or, or, or Raiden, and um, and I'll be pleased to uh, help anyone uh, through the uh, Heritage Currency Department. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's always a delight to see you, Bruce. I'm sorry we didn't have you the whole time, but if there's uh, anything you'd like to say in terms of closing remarks for those who are joining us, feel free to do that since uh, since you're here. Well, like always, I just want to really, uh, really thank all the Heritage clients and uh, collectors that um, you know participated in the auctions. Uh, uh, you know, they made the first sale such a great success. And, uh, you know, that interest is, um, you know, is really appreciated by, uh, you know, by, uh, you know, my Coltrane, his family and, uh, and, uh, Stu Maureen Levine and I as, uh, as consultants. And, um, we just appreciate the interest and also the very hard work by, uh, you know, the heritage team to really make this a very successful auction. Well, thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to see you, and uh, it's, uh, I look forward to doing this again. I assume there's a part three, a part four. A... This is it. This is it. This this is wow. The, the, yeah, this is the culmination of the Mike Coltrane collection of currency. Um, it's online now. If you want a part of it, uh, I recommend you go to ha.com/currency. Uh, it's one of your preview slides, and uh, take a look. Email us, call us if you have any questions, if there's uh, particular lots that you might be interested in, or just want to say, hey, wh what's the best note that I can get for $10,000? We're, we're happy to answer that too. So, Yeah, and I think I would point out that, you know, in addition to the signature live session on uh, Thursday night at uh, 5 o'clock Central, uh, there's a there's a beautiful and very diverse uh, internet session on, uh, on Friday. Uh, with a lot of great collector quality notes. Well, gentlemen, I look forward to catching up with you afterwards. We may do another one of these and talk about how well Coltrane did and uh, do some other uh, discussions as well. Uh, now that we have this new format and the uh, it looks crisp, it sounds crisp, and uh, it's archived for forever. So you'll be able to watch this again. If uh, you have friends, tell your friends, tell your family. Thanks, guys. This was great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you next time, and we'll see you Thursday at 5 o'clock Central for my Coltrane collection part two. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks.